Welcome to the Plague Hive. Today I'm joined by Bino, who recently won the German National Championship with Nu. First up, congratulations on the win and thank you for joining me on the channel today to talk about your list. Thanks uh, as well for having me. Anytime. So Nu is fairly new to the meta, um, pun not intended in this case, but she's already making some waves and there's a number of different builds floating around. Apart from like individual card choices, obviously, I think the main difference between is like if you're playing a high chi list, right, that utilizes the Mask of Recurring Nightmares or a slightly lower chi list that uses normally Traverse the Universe or sometimes Balance of Justice or Crown of Providence, stuff like that. So what was the idea for you to go with Nu for this particular tournament? And what's the, the core idea behind the list that you decided to run? And we're gonna switch over so you guys can see the list. Well, first of all, I uh, basically played Assassin all the time and I played a lot of Uzuri and when Part Mistvale was announced I immediately decided uh, I would have to go for Nu or maybe stay with Uzuri and uh, stick with the deck if some great additions will be in Part Mistvale but it turned out the generic Assassin cards that are not Mystic are not really helping out a lot for Zuri and they are just well the the whole set uh, or the assassin part of the set is all built around new so it was that hero and it was obvious for me to do that mm -hmm. um well and i started testing new builds one week before part of the mist Bale came out and uh well played it a lot and when it finally was revealed i bought all the cards and played it from the first week on okay and i just think it's the perfect deck for me mm -hmm. uh that is really fun to play and also really strong <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Like, she's definitely a ton of fun to play with. And even though I think she's sometimes a little bit infuriating for the opponents, um, because you just have so much disruption and it never stops, right? Like, most turns you can strip, like, two cards from the opponent's hand if things go your way a bit. And they don't disrupt you back, right? Like, obviously against a deck like a, a, a Guardian, maybe, or... Um, a ranger like Azalea, where you have to block some on-hit effects, uh, it gets a little bit lower, but when they're just trading damage and you can decide to keep a hand that just has like double or even sometimes triple disruption, um, it can get pretty nasty and, and they have to kind of respect what you're doing. And that's actually an element that was always like a little bit missing to me with Azuri, if you know what I mean, where yes, she could... Definitely. She could usually line up like a single disruptive effect once per turn fairly consistently, right? And then you had evasion on that in, in the form of like isolate or daggers, stuff like that, right? But if the opponent was just like, okay, I'm going to take that CNC, uh, I'm going to take that leave no witnesses, I don't care about my arsenal, I'm just going to keep a four card hand and then just kill you, you know, the way like KO could do um, a lot of the time. I found that was pretty rough uh, for her to actually, you know, deal with that. So, and, and, and in that regard, I think, like you said, Nu is a lot stronger because her disruption is just harder for the opponent to ignore. Yes, like also in Azuri, if you even if you hit with the surgical extraction, which I feel is the best disruption in the game she had. Yeah, they might still end up holding a three card hand plus arsenal and well if it's a ranger and they have like a couple of buffs and an arrow yeah. they literally don't care what card you take and they might still have a good turn anyways yeah that's true so that that was that was definitely an issue with with azuri so yeah in that regard and what you said earlier about how like even the generic assassin cards in this set just work better with new than azuri i also completely agree with that right it's like because you have Prognosis and you have um, Bonds of Agony, of course, and those are cards that you can run in Uzuri, and they're not bad in Uzuri by any means, right? 
Um, but specifically Bonds of Agony, because you have these like double reactions, like Venomous Bite, His, and also the equipments, obviously, um, are just so much easier to actually activate uh, in new compared to Azuri, where you would have to go like isolate, swap into Bonds, uh, maybe play like a Shred if they block it, and then also flick knives on top of that or use your like uh, boots, like Black Text or something. So it's just a lot harder to get it online consistently. And um, for new, it's just a lot easier. And then she has stuff like the daggers, which buff your blue. So those are better with her. And she just has like the whole mystic talent pool to work with. Um, so you have cards like levels of enlightenment, which are just insane. So yeah, I, I do agree that I think in the current meta, um, new is definitely the stronger <laughs> hero. So, all right, we can talk about uh, the meta and like matchups and stuff a bit later, but uh, first up, maybe let's just go over the list, what you decided to bring to the event and why you decided to run certain card choices. So um, let's take it from the top, start with the equipment. What's the ideas there? Well, okay, so first of all, I looked at some Traverse builds and I, I felt like they are not as powerful mm. and I literally want to have the mask in every matchup because Tripping a card from their hand is just amazing in, uh, well, any kind of matchup. So I decided to go for a high chi and Mask of Perdition, uh, Mask of Recurring Nightmares build. Yep. And, well, I think literally no deck in the game likes to banish a card from their hand. And if you do that consistently, like almost every turn, um, it... It's just uh, supporting your game plan mm -hmm. very well. And so that is the the equipment I just want to have in every matchup. Okay. And I honestly never missed the Traverse thing, because if I go for Traverse and maybe Unravel Aggression or something, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm just a very bad mid-range deck, because Mu is not a good uh, blocking hero. Yeah. I mean, like, I think her blocking is okay. Uh, the issue, I feel, is she's a really bad mid-range hero, generally, right? Like, most of the things she can do with two cards are just not very scary, right? So I guess in that yeah. in that sense, you're, you're correct. Like, she's a bad blocking hero in the sense that she requires larger hands to actually do something that's threatening, right? And she can't do this, like block six isolate cnc thing that was like the i would say bread and butter uzuri game plan right where you block with two cards uh you send a stealth card and you threaten to swap and they don't know what's coming right that was kind of like yeah. the the core thing that uzuri did and i think if you manage to consistently reduce new to two card hands she becomes a lot less threatening essentially right um, yes, and also also Mask of Recurring Nightmares makes uh, block decisions much harder. Yeah. Like if I play a surgical extraction and have one resource floating and a card in my hand, it might be quite obvious that it's a venomous bite or maybe a hiss. Yeah. Um, however, if I have the mask, it could also just be a transcend card. Yeah. Or if I have two cards and I play Prognosis, um, well, if you block with one card, that's... A disaster if i have just a nick yeah however if you block with two cards it's a disaster if i just have a yeah, transcend yeah, yeah. card and activate mask so it is better for doing some mind games it's it's like you consistently present these like 50 50 decisions to the opponent where they cannot play around both things they have to decide am i playing around the the pump reaction or am i playing around the transcend card and the mask activation and there's yeah. like and there's no good way they can decide. They have to gamble and just decide for one. And if they decide correctly, cool. You can just arsenal the card, right? Um, or if they decide incorrectly, also cool. You get to punish them, right? So um, it's a win-win situation for you most of the time. So I, I agree with that. Like the list that I ran was also mask and then high chi. Uh, I decided to run uh, seven. You went uh, up to eight. Um, but I think that's like nuances, right? Uh, the core idea of the deck is like high chi, try to mask as much as possible. So, um, okay, sure. Yeah. I, I, get I mean, the rest, I think, uh, is 
pretty standard. Mm -hmm. I I mean, you can add some other daggers like Orbital Cluster or something, but mm -hmm. I think those three daggers are kind of fine. Yep. Well, I guess we have to run of Embrace at the moment because otherwise the Enigma matchup is just way too hard. Yeah. I, I think and, even with Vembrace, it's definitely unfavored, but Vembrace does help a lot, so it's kind of necessary, yeah. I agree there. I, I think it's quite winnable with Vembrace, mm -hmm. but obviously still a bad matchup. Yeah. And I also decided to go for AB3 uh -huh. um, because I feel like the Kano matchup is... Well, it's obviously not good, but yeah. it's totally winnable with AB3. Mm -hmm. You basically force them to not kill you on first cycle. And yeah. if they like, they have to pivot to pitch stacking. And if they go for pitch stacking, my only goal is to uh, like set up a good bonds mm -hmm. that is able to shuffle their deck and yeah. well, delay, delay the pitch stack for five more turns and maybe you get there then in the time yeah it just gives you more more breathing room right so it's still not favored and if they know how to pitch stack well and they can you know start pitch stacking again if you land the bonds like sometimes that's a little bit hard for them but um i, I agree that i think against a very good kano you're probably still going to lose um but against like the i would say average kano player if such a thing exists, um, I agree that going with AB3, especially if you also have Oasis, which is not in your list, but if you do also run that, um, I think that that makes the matchup doable, at least. I wouldn't say favorite. It's it's like the Vambrace thing against Enigma, right? It's still not a matchup you're happy to see, but um, it's it's winnable if you if you get a little bit lucky. Right, yeah. But I'm, I'm not sold on oasis though okay. because oasis just doesn't help you against kano i think because okay. if they if they reach the pitch stack and it's a good one and they play a i don't know triple wildfire turn mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't really matter if you have an oasis no that's true. and if you just draw it in a random situation it will not help you kill them and mm -hmm. if you arsenal it it probably can be stuck there for three turns because they have to block your stuff and don't present anything. And then you draw Codex of Frailties that are blanks because your arsenal is kind of... Kind of stuck, yeah, yeah, like yeah okay. Stuck with an Oasis. So I, I really don't like the card against Kano. Might be a weird take, but no, it I, feels I, like it's not helping. I think I get it. Like, if you're, if you're trying to... Like, I think your 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 take is correct if the kano plays correctly against ab3 right um if they go okay ab3 means i have to stack and then they they identify that and they play accordingly right um you might end up with somebody going hey i just drew a pretty nuts hand and they still try to temper you even though you have ab3 and I think that's the situation where Oasis is kind of like an insulation card in a sense, right? Um, but I agree that it doesn't help against a stack, right? If they hit like the triple wildfire, it doesn't matter if you have Oasis. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, so my, my game plan is just kill them and shuffle their deck. That's yep. how okay. I try to win the matchup. So, uh, and Oasis neither shuffles the deck nor kills them. It kills them. Yeah, okay. So, I don't like the card. Okay, yeah, it makes sense. I get that. Okay, and then for the rest of the equipment, so we got AB3, we got Vambrace, uh, we got Spider Spite and Scale Peeler, uh, Beckoning Mistblade, of course, just because it's a... Like, actually, what's what's your thoughts on, on Mistblade, right? Because I think when the card was first spoilered, um, I, I think it was actually... It was leaked a couple days ahead of the official spoiler, and people were like, nah, this is fake. That can't be real. It seems way too powerful. And then it was actually real. And people were like, holy crap, this card is insane. Um, and then people tested it and started go like, eh, it's actually not that great. And then people tested it some more and went like, actually, it is pretty great. So it, it went through a couple of stages 
um, of of evaluation, at least in my experience, like interacting with with other assassin players that I know. Um, so, what's your take on on beckoning Mistblade actually after you know obviously testing the deck a whole bunch and and playing at nationals and winning it? Well, first of all, let's state that the card is great. Mm -hmm. It is just well, you can read the card. It literally does what is written on it, and that's a good effect. Yeah. And well, basically, the only question that comes to your mind if you build a new deck is, do I play one misplate or maybe even two misplates? Uh -huh. I think no one would run a list without misplates. Uh -huh. So, well, obviously, it's a very good dagger, but. I think what Assassin is really great at is making blocking decisions awkward for the opponent. Yeah. And so I, I want to have a Spider Spider or a Scale Peeler into, let's say, every matchup. I know there are some double Mistblade Flick Knives builds. And, well, the, the one argument to go for double Mistblade is Guardians and maybe KO. Yeah. And I think I don't want to build my deck to be especially great against Guardian decks mm -hmm. because, well, the matchup should be good enough even with one misplayed. Mm -hmm. So, and, well, if I wanted to play the second misplayed, I probably would have to cut AB, and I don't want to do that because that would just concede the Kano matchup. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So it's like, a, I, I guess it's a decision of what do you want to respect more in a sense right um where you go okay i i don't want to run into a kano like there's not that many typically i think there was like what three at the german nationals but if you run ab2 you probably lose against them whereas if you run a single misplate into something like a ko or a guardian you still have a pretty good chance of winning it right uh, it's still, I would say, at least into Guardian, it's a favorite matchup. Into KO, uh, with single misplayed, it's probably like, I don't know, 50-50 or something. Or maybe, yeah. even, a I mean, bit, I, maybe I even, even a bit better I, than that. I even faced a KO in round 10, I think. Yeah. And, well, the matchup felt... Like, even if even when playing a very good player who was also... Or maybe it was round... Yeah, well, round 10, I think. We were 8-1, and... So obviously they knew what the, what they were doing, and yeah. I was able to win the game. So matchup against KO shouldn't be too bad with this list. Sounds good. Yeah, I think it's just inherently because they play good blues. Like Nu is is good against any hero that plays good blues, where your hero ability actually exists and you actually have a text on your hero, right? Um, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I I get that reasoning. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and then we have, like, Tunic. I mean, yeah. I don't think we need to talk about Tunic. It's Tunic. It's a good card. Uh, as long as Assassin doesn't get a better chest piece, um, it's going to stay with Tunic. I was I was testing around a little bit with, like, uh, Redback Shroud. Not even necessarily because of the cost reduction, but just because it's another equipment piece that has an attack reaction on it. Um, so it makes Bonds of Agony better. But it just has this like inherent anti-synergy with Hiss and Venomous Bite, where you want to actually pitch for them. Uh, you want to have a blue in your pitch zone to actually get the maximum effect. So Redback Shroud actually has like this yeah, anti-synergy with uh, Hiss and Venomous Bite. So, And the deck doesn't generate a ton of silver, I think, in most situations. Like you'll get some silver randomly from like Leave No Witnesses and Surgical sometimes. Um, but in my in my opinion, it's not enough silver generation to really support something like uh, Redback Shroud over Tunic anyway. So yeah, um, no, Tunic, Tunic is just amazing. Yeah, like it's... any deck where you run Codex of Frailty and Command and Conquer and blue cards. Yep, should run Tunic. True, I guess. True. No, I agree. Like Tunic is just good. Um, uh, and then we have the uh, new common equipment pieces from Mistvale, uh, Arousing Wave, and Undertow Stilettos. So I've seen a bunch of new decks that still run like the older Assassin equipment, right? Um, specifically Flick Knives in the arm slot, uh, and then also um, Black Tech Whispers in the boot slot. 
typically not exclusively, but as like in addition to these two, right? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I think what I was thinking when building the deck is I really want to hit three reactions on bonds as consistently as possible. Uh -huh. Because honestly, I think bonds of agony is just, well, <laughs> shit off a card. It's, it's amazing how good that card is. Like, yeah. even the threat of being able to maybe activate three attack reactions lets people drive crazy and block with their whole hand or just with their one power card they have in hand. Yeah. Because yeah. uh, they don't want to lose it. And, yep. well, I really want to, like, if, if someone just calls the bluff and says, I, I'm not going to block your bonds and I just pray that you don't have three reactions. And yep. if you do, I just play my art of war and uh, you banish some random other card. And, well, it happens. It happens that people just say, I call your bluff. Yeah. And if they call my bluff, I don't want it to be a bluff. I want to be able to uh, to use three attack reactions. So that's why I also didn't cut any of the red reactions. I've okay. seen some people doing it, like cutting his or cutting venomous bites down to two. Yeah. Or cutting just a nick, or I don't know. And I literally want as all, all the red attack reactions. And, well, that's also an additional reason for the Mask of Recurring Nightmare, because you need one attack reaction in addition to a Venomous yeah. Bite or a hit. So you, you could do, like, obviously, uh, uh, if your hand is, like, Bonds and a Transcend card, and you have Tunic up, right? You can do, like, the two-card Bonds, where you go uh, Banish to Mask, and then you... Um, you activate like stilettos or a rousing wave and the bonds goes up to four and then maybe five if it was a rousing wave, right? So you can get even over like a sink below or something. Um, so yeah, it's a card that's incredibly hard for the opponent to correctly block, right? Uh, and if your second card is just a nick, right? You have bonds, nick and tunic up, it gets even harder for them because that bonds is now coming in for nine or 10, depending on which equipment you crack. Um, and that's a nightmare to block if you want to actually block it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's a much, even much better line because, well, I ended up often pitching into mask uh, mm -hmm. when I activated three attack reactions. Yeah. And well, if after bonds I activate mask and uh, yeah, like it's obvious that there will be two more attack reactions. They eventually just banish the best card in their hand and yeah. the bonds on hit effect isn't as strong as it was earlier yeah so actually having a three react line without mask is much better in some situations mm -hmm. but oftentimes you're not able to do that yeah i mean there's an argument right like if if uh, you attack with bonds and then you activate mask and they banish like their i don't know blood rush right or something like that uh, there's an argument to just you know keep your equipment i think if that was your line right you were like bonds and then a transcend card and you have tunic for like stilettos or or wave i think in some situations you can just go like all right um i'm i'm going to keep my arousing wave uh, i'm going to keep the stilettos Bonds hits for one, I'm fine with that, and nothing happens. Uh, you banished your power card, and let's just, you know, go to the next turn cycle, some, something like that. Um, I think it's it's situational, right? Like, uh, in a lot of situations, you still want to Bonds to hit, to strip another card, and then maybe get some cards out of their deck. It's very... We have this meme in the Assassin community, right? Where it's like, it depends, is the most frequent answer to a question anybody asks, like literally any question people would just go like, it depends, because it's so situational um, for these decks. Yeah, yeah, I think it's true in this case as well. It, yeah. it always depends. Yeah, yeah, very much depends on the game state and what the life totals are, what the hands are looking like, you know, stuff like that. If you're in first or second mm -hmm. cycle, um, lots of variants, lots of different factors that influence the decision, yeah. Okay. Um, it's also like... Do I think that even without the blood rush, they probably still have a good turn? In that mm -hmm. case, I I want the bonds to hit and strip another card. And yeah. if 
I feel like probably they don't have a good turn because they already committed two cards. Yeah. Oftentimes just fine with closing combat chain and end turn. Yeah. Yeah. That that makes sense, yeah. Okay, all right. So that takes care of the um, equipment loadouts. Um, actually, speaking of equipment, after the nationals, uh, do you feel like any piece of equipment like under or overperformed, and you would change anything, or would you be happy running this list with this equipment loadout again? Well, with the equipment, I'm super happy. Yes, mm -hmm. I don't okay. think that I would change anything. Okay. Nice. And we can talk about the rest of the deck once we've gone through that. And then the same question again, basically. So, um, okay, so let's go through the deck a little bit here. I think there's a, a couple of cards that are just like standard stuff, right? And um, that we don't need to touch on too much. Stuff like Command and Conquer, uh, Leave No Witnesses, Codex of Frailty. Um, then we have like uh, Surgical Extraction is an insane card. I think it's probably the best card Nu has access to, to some capacity in a lot of situations. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about uh, the cards that are maybe a little more up for debate, I think. So um, you already talked about you want the maximum number of red reactions that you can have. So you run Triple His, Triple Venomous by Triple Justinic. And like you said, there's some lists that cut some number of these. Um, I'm like, personally, I'm on two his, for example, uh, just because I needed a little bit of space and I found his to be the reaction that's like generally the least impactful um, in a lot of matchups. Um, but I can see the reasoning behind making bonds as consistent as possible. So you just keep all of these in. That makes total sense to me. <laughs> Um, yeah, also, I would say like his into Enigma. I think yeah, basically going wide is what can win you the game. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Like you don't, I think uh, a lot of people tried stuff like Malign or Pick to Pieces. Um, but I think that's not actually what, what wins you the game because they have too many ways to play around it. Um, so if you can just present a consistent go wide turn that has like two to three attacks every turn... Um, by utilizing stuff like his, uh, looking for a scrap, you know, and just daggers, obviously, too. Um, I think that that helps a lot, yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I won against an Enigma in the Swiss rounds, and I mm -hmm. think it was, it would have not been able without looking for a scrap. Yeah. But when, when they tried to, like, give me all their equipment to protect the Mira guy with Four counters or with mm -hmm. five counters i think yeah um i had the looking for scraps level of enlightenment codex of frailty cnc turn and they ended up oh. having nothing and and very nice equipments and they were, weren't able to attack with the mirror guy and it just died yeah. the turn after it oh that's nice yeah that that feels really good um if you're able to it's just going, push going wide it's the way to go yeah i agree I think that's the, the best way to approach the matchup is just try to kind of do a ninja cosplay and just send a lot of attacks at them. That, and then eventually they won't be able to keep up. Um, that's kind of how it goes. Uh, so yeah, in that regard, actually, the, the next card I was um, going to talk about also falls on that, like Enlightened Strike. Um, I've yeah. seen a lot of people question Enlightened Strike in Nu. Um, I know it's been a, an absolute staple in Azuri, um, and then a lot of people just included it in new because they were approaching the, the deck building with like a similar ideas, essentially. Um, and I, I do agree that it does feel slightly worse in new compared to Azuri, I think, just because new runs so many more blues, right? So if you bottom a red with an enlightened strike, you go, okay, great. This is essentially the same rate as looking for a scrap, right? Um, I, I bottomed one pitch, one resource, basically, uh, to get five go again. And if you bottom a blue, um, suddenly you're like, okay, I am losing two resources in this scenario now. So, um, yeah, what's your what's your experience with, with Enlightened Strike? Well, first of all, I thought Enlightened Strike doesn't really support my game plan and I didn't want to play it and then I started testing against Enigmas and well there was no, literally no other option than playing E-Strike to win yeah. this matchup so I ended up 
including three copies of it. And yeah. also, there are like these games where you have all the tempo, and then, especially with my build, you have a totally brick, and you draw like only reactions or mm-hmm. something like that. And in the, those scenarios, it's great if you have an e strike in your deck, or maybe you arsenal an e strike earlier. Yeah. Um, it's also a card you can almost every time clear. Like if if it's or it, it can't really be stuck in your arsenal. Yeah. Uh, it's a very good ponder target. Mm-hmm. True. And yeah. well, there are also just scenarios where you have your big go wide turns where you have I don't know stilettos. Maybe you have a hiss that you play on the levels that has go again anyway. Yeah. And in those scenarios, you can just get an extra slither yep. or fang spike, bottom it with it, and yep. win for seven. Or maybe just draw a card and use the sliver on it anyway. So yep. um, there are many, many ways to make e strike better than it looks. I think the fact that you can bottom uh, slither and fang strike with it specifically um, makes it interesting enough to keep a new, right? So yeah, anyways, I, I, I agree that it E-Strike doesn't feel great in the deck, but I think it's just a necessary card um, because everything else you can run as an extender is worse, right? Um, you can't really run uh, Ravenous Rebel, obviously, in a deck with like 30 blues. Um, that doesn't work. Uh, you can't run... Um, like scar for a scar i think specifically because it's bad into the matchups where you need the extenders and yeah other stuff is just like hurl um i don't know zero for three is just kind of not not gonna get you there uh in a lot of cases i think so e-strike just kind of feels necessary and it blocks three so you can just kind of leave it in the main board if you don't have anything else to bring in and it's it's always gonna be fine you're always gonna get a minimum of three value from it like defensively so i think it's fine to run yeah i think i i run it in almost every matchup Mm -hmm. all right um so yeah i think that takes care of like the reds here in the main board and we have yeah codex of frailty i think we don't need to talk about that again a card that feels a bit worse in new than it did in uzuri um, mostly because you run more reactions and then if you arsenal a reaction it can brick you a little bit if you draw up a codex um, but overall the card is just way too good to to cut it I think I've seen a couple of lists that cut it to like two and I, I just think you need to run three codex of frailty the card is such an insane tempo swing in a lot of situations and like you said earlier right like any deck that runs a, a dagger and tunic and codex of frailty um yeah, it's just a good combination, I think, to just go like pitch to dagger, codex of frailty, CNC, tunic, um, and then you can play the CNC, especially when you have spider's bite, right? And um, that's that's like the one line. I don't run spider's bite myself. Um, I run one of the double misplayed flick knives lists, right? Um, and that's the one line where I really miss spider's bite. It's like being able to go spider's bite, codex, CNC, because that line is fantastic. All right, um, so maybe let's talk a little bit about the blue base. I think Bonds of Agony and Persuasive Prognosis are just standard. You kind of have to run these. And then you have uh, six other blue stealth cards. And in your case, those are Art of Desire Mind and Double Trouble. So why did you decide on those? And did you test out other combinations of blue stealth cards, like more of them, less of them? different versions and uh, why did you end up with like these particular uh, 12 that you now run well um i tested almost all the blue stealth cards that mm-hmm. were available i mean not something like prowl but sure the <laughs> <ones>. understandable um, yeah <laughs> maybe prowl is the way to go but yeah i don't know <laughs> probably not yeah uh, and well, double trouble is just it, it. It's kind of the same as uh, blue infect, mm-hmm. and I was like, I I have seen many people trying blue infect. Yeah. Well, I think because I built my deck to be able to 
activate three reactions on a given chain link anyway, yep. I can also easily go for two reactions and then double trouble is the same rate as in fact. Uh -huh. But I get the two values anyway, even if it doesn't hit. So okay. let's say my opponent blocks for, I don't know, two. Or maybe my opponent just, if I, if I go misplayed and then double trouble for two, yeah. and my opponent just blocks with one card, right. then in fact would deal no damage and double trouble would deal two damage or, or one damage. So right, okay. The, the value of double trouble might be more consistent and also in some matchups it just helps you getting value of your hero power. So, right. Um, double you trouble. some extra cards, yeah. Mm -hmm. I felt like it. It never really was great, but it also never was bad. And Art of Desire Mind is just because, um, especially because I run uh, full cop three copies of Siren's Call in the yeah. sideboard, um, I think Art of Desire Mind is kind of the best stealth card in blue I can have. Yep. Because, well, sometimes I just attack with it and if my opponent has blue action cards in their hand and yeah. I want to play a Siren's Call anyway, yeah. I immediately get some value of that. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So, like I, I think this is like the Art of Desire Mind is like the the third best stealth card basically after Prognosis and Bonds of Agony. Right? And then I think the the fourth slot is kinda like personal choice essentially. Right? I, Essentially, I, yes. Yeah. I think no, none of the blue stealth attacks is especially great. Yeah. Uh, that's why I also didn't want to run more than 12. Yeah, agreed. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I was actually not really happy with my blue base because most of the cards are just irrelevant. Yeah. But there are not so many good blues that also block three. So, yeah. I mean, we'll come to that in a second. Yeah. But... Um, what I figured was important is that looking for a scrap is uh, consistently mm -hmm. a super hit and not a one for four do nothing. So um, after testing a couple of games into Enigma, I felt like, yeah, with 12 stealth cards, it's absolutely consistent and looking for a scrap is always doing what I wanted to do. Yeah. So the 12 cards were enough yeah now that's that's the number i ended up on uh too um like 15 was just felt too much um and then a nine felt like a little bit too few right um i i personally ran like bonds of attraction instead of double trouble but i think honestly you can just kind of pick whatever like infect is fine double trouble i think is fine especially like in your list if you like you said maximize like the double reactions right i think uh sedate is an option that you could run where where you have a little bit more consistency into zen because you can just keep them off arsenal a little bit more there's just like a whole bunch of of cards that you can run in this spot and neither of them are particularly great right they're just kind of like, this is my fourth stealth card that I run. And most of the time, it's going to either pitch three or block three and be fodder for like looking for a scrap. Uh, and that's kind of why you run it. And sometimes you get occasional extra benefit out of it. So, yeah. Um, to be honest, I honestly like the on hit of double trouble into Zen. Okay. And I think I like it even more than just an inertia token. All right. Because, well, my goal is to strip enough cards of uh, them anyway so that they don't have a good turn. Uh -huh. And I, I like my main goal against them is I try to make them not have a turn. Yeah. And inertia doesn't really prevent them from having a turn, it no, prevents them from setting up after the turn after that turn mm -hmm. but well normally they are able to convert their whole hand yeah and sure the inertia token doesn't really prevent some damage but uh, double trouble might get me closer to fatiguing them which is an option i think sure yeah. and also gets me closer to play a very good turn out of the vanish zone 
Yeah, when you can get like ancestral harmony and then a couple of like blue descendant, blue bonds, maybe like a, a blue hundred wins or something, you know, um, that that's a very legitimate win con against Zen, actually. Yeah, like killing them with their own combo cards. Um, definitely a thing that can happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then we have uh, levels of enlightenment, which is just, I think better in new than in any of the other mystic heroes specifically because the line of mist blade into levels is so 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 good right yes, i agree yeah I, I think it's good in all three of them and it's so good in new that the other mystics have to sideboard it out if they play against us because if the levels ends up in their banished zone they're in for a really bad time so, I, yeah, the, the card is just crazy good. It's basically like E-Strike in blue, kind of, except with like a higher ceiling. It's kind of insane, honestly. And then we have the the, the cards that kind of round out the blue base. And I think this is like what you were talking about earlier, that there's not enough really good blues that also block three. Um, so I assume this is where like Cosmic Awakening second tenant of chi moon and rowdy locals comes in right yeah. so yeah let's talk about these three a little bit maybe we start with rowdy locals because i feel like that's actually one of the better ones because it does yeah, have I mean, this it has disruption on it essentially on a blue and that's like what we want more or less yeah i mean rowdy locals and also second tenant of chi moon uh, started being blue hiss and blue venomous bites and yep. Well, it didn't feel as consistent. So there was obviously the problem of the mirror where I yeah. have so many blues that has to be boarded out. Yeah. Um, but even that aside, I think um, I think it was too inconsistent. And you draw like hands with blue his, red his, blue venomous, red venomous. Yeah. And that's a terrible hand because you end up daggering twice and arsenaling a red reaction yeah you just um, completely give up tempo yeah so i needed to find some blues that are playable without um yeah like without being too terrible mm -hmm. and uh well the good cards were already in my list so i had to look for some others mm -hmm. and well first of all a teammate of mine uh said, why don't you try second tenants? Mm -hmm. And I started playing second tenant of Key Tide and Moon. Mm -hmm. And I like, I, I actually liked the idea and sometimes they were really good. Like you just have a good, uh, like a, a relevant attack that you can play in these kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. But also there, we still got the same problem than that Second tenant of Chi Moon and Tide and Levels of Enlightenment were nine blues I have to board out in the mirror. Yeah. I replaced the other second tenant with Rowdy Locals. And that was also a suggestion of my teammate. It was not my idea. And I was skeptical in the first place, but the more I play with Rowdy Locals, the more I like it. Yeah. Because it is like the decks that are actually annoyed by it are also the decks that are not able to efficiently block it yeah so um like if i if i play this into a guardian they would just not care yeah but if you play this into zen it hits almost every time or they give me equipment yeah exactly and, well so rowdy locals feels fine i also had a very neat line into levia um during the nets where i just like they started the game and in my turn one i just had misplayed rowdy locals for three go again then i discard leave no witness and play codex to play the oh. leave no witness again and that's just a very neat turn yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I saw that on stream actually. That was a that was a fantastic line where normally that codex would have been just useless in that hand, and because of Rowdy Local specifically, it actually was very good. And you got to strip like I think two cards out of their hand and then still leave them without an arsenal. 
Yeah, exactly. And well, yeah. like if they block block the misplayed, I would just pick the rowdy locals for another dagger and play the lethal witness arsenal yeah. codex. Yeah, would yeah, be yeah. fine still. Yeah, but if they let me hit with the dagger, which they often do, yeah, it can be a very good line. Yeah. So rowdy locals is a very flexible card. I think it can do lots of things. Yeah. In some situations, you might even activate an equipment just to get a slither or fang strike and discard it into it. Yeah. Um, but it only happened once during the tournament. Uh, it's quite rare that it's the correct play, but it can it happen can be. sometimes. Like if you just go, I need to strip a card right now, um, you can do that. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if you're, if it's like, if I let this Zen keep a four card hand, I'm dead. Um, you can do this play. So it's it's the it's a very flexible card, I think. Uh, it's very good in the late game too, right? Where they're down to like low life totals, and then if they block it, it goes up to four, and it still hits. Um, and yeah, just and it blocks three. Like the flexibility of it is is what I like actually. Yeah, and I, I've actually experimented with. Uh, blue cut down to size because I just wanted another blue that is like a consistent disruptive piece and it was relevant once I think uh, in the games that I played but I definitely don't like that it just blocks two that's the, the major obviously massive downside that the card has uh, but it does do it is a con consistent disruptive piece like most people are just going to give you a card on it and then if you have a chi, you can transcend, right? And uh, pitch it to mask. Um, so you strip yeah, another however, card. If, if, they have, if they have the soul read and don't block you, and yeah, then, you then the one card, it feels terrible. It feels terrible, I agree, yeah. But I, I think it's something that you're going to be able to catch out an opponent with, like maybe once or twice. You play it the first time. And they go like, ah, oh, yeah, I need to block this because I'm going to lose a card anyways. And then you you transcend or you already have a chi in hand, right? I think the second time you play it out, um, they're, they're probably just not going to block it. So it, it, again, it turns into a mind game thing, right? Where they go like, ah, do you have the do you have the chi or do you just want to arsenal a card or something, you know? Um, I agree it's definitely not a, a good card. It's not great. It was just like... Yeah. I want another blue disruptive card, and this is like the best I can do, even though it's not a great card. You know, that was kind of where I ended up. Um, but I can totally see just not having the extra disruptive blue and just playing something like Second Tenet or, you know, um, to, to just kind of like round out your blue base in that way, you know? Um, I, so, okay, the last I think, one. Yeah. I think um, Second Tenet of Moon is. Um a good value card mm -hmm. but it is in a spot where i would rather have a disruptive card so if yeah. cut down to size was a three block i would immediately slam it yeah if it was a three so block it would be way 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 better 100 percent. or my let's say pursuit of knowledge if it yeah. were a three block i would totally slam it in a spot yeah. but actually these cards or these three slots should be just some some three block blues and yep. well that is the best I could come up with at the yeah, moment. Yeah. I I agree. Like there's a lots of cards you can run in those slots and none of them feel particularly great. They just kind of feel like I have to run these cards because I need more blues, and that's that's just kind of what ends up hack happening. Right. I think these are also kind of flex slots. You right. Like anyone building new can kind of put whatever they feel like the best choice in these slots. And then they just end up running those cards, right? I do agree Rowdy Locals is probably the best. Um, just because it, it's a blue block three that can disrupt sometimes. Even though it's like awkward disruption, but it's still good. And then the other cards are just kind of like, you know, personal choice. So, um, yeah, let's talk about actually the last one here, Cosmic Awakening. Um, I, I guess the idea is to have this sort of like as a second cycle pitch stack option against grindy decks. Uh, did that actually ever end up being irrelevant in the tournament or in your testing? Well, in the tournament, it didn't come up. In the testing, it did a mm -hmm. lot. And 
like the the card shines most in the mirror actually it just wins okay. mirrors yeah because the mom, at some point both new players are in this weird chess end game where they just pitch cheese to activate hero abilities and yeah. mask yeah and there is no arsenal disruption left because yep. well all the blue cards attack the hand and uh -huh. not the arsenal the arsenal is always just attacked by the red card true and so in the very end game <clears throat> if you're able to just find a cosmic awakening hold it and put it into your arsenal yep. um you can literally just wait until you get the spot to send it for 20 or 15. right and in these scenarios oftentimes it's just good enough to get in for 15 mm -hmm. and normally the other new player has like one blocking card left in their deck anyway and right. uh, so they just take 12 if they commit their whole three block to it yeah okay. so it actually it actually can win mirrors yep and well yeah so so i i really love the card i okay. was not that convinced of it uh, at first but it ended up being relevant quite a few times Okay, I can I can see it totally as like a specifically mirror tech card. Um, I can hundred percent see that. Also, because it's a card where if they banish it like randomly and it just you know ends up, it, it doesn't matter, right? Like if they banish it, it they can't play it. Like it's or they can play it, but it just attacks for zero, and it's they not can a card. Play it as a one ball again after misplayed. If they okay, are really yeah. <laughs> looking True. for it, in the top, but if there's nothing. Not so if there's nothing better in there, yeah, they can send it for one go again. But yeah, um, it's a, a specifically mirror tech card that is good in a mirror because it's unplayable for them. Um, and it's yeah, easy it's, to pitch it's, stack it's a, it. It's a blue card that is good against new yeah. and they cannot use it. Even that's though kinda, they're all yeah, that's true. New. That's actually kind of rare. Like most blues where you go like this would be a good card in the mirror. Uh, are terrible specifically because the opposing new can also use them against you. So yeah, I, I would never consider to include snack for the mirror or something because yeah. if they banish they it and then they can play they it against your bonds, it. yeah, no, that's terrible. Like that's that's a really dangerous dangerous card to run. Actually, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's cool. I get that. Like it's one sideboard slot to just make the mirror better, and I think. I mean, we've seen in like the the week two um, of nationals that new was actually the the deck with the most wins. I think it was like five five nationals were won by new, and one was four were like won by Zen something like that. So um, new is actually taking over as like the deck to beat in a way, right? Just because it's I think the best deck against Zen. And Zen is likely the best deck overall, so we're seeing a lot of news uh, actually convert to top eight and even like win and, and finish as well. I think it makes sense to respect the matchup a little bit more and just bring a card that is specifically good in the mirror. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, so yeah, that takes care of the uh, main board, and we've heard all of the reasons for the the specific card. So let's go over the sideboard a little bit. But uh, maybe we start with the cheat cards because um, those are kind of like central to the strategy of the deck, right? You said this is a high chi deck. Um, you want to activate mask as often as possible, have it as consistent as possible. Uh, so to that end, you run um, eight chi cards. So everything but uh, drop in the ocean, which I get because that yeah. card is terrible in my opinion, um, at least for, for new. It's a little bit better for Enigma, I think. Um, so yeah, why did you decide to go with eight, and how would you rank them, in in your opinion and in your experience? Like, which is the best one, and which one do you want to see the least? The best ones are whatever I can play without an attack as a target because okay. they are just so much more flexible. Mm -hmm. So the homage, Passover, Reserve Tradition. Start uh, apart, rising, rising sun. I yep. like them a lot, and then by far the best of the others is uh, Path Well Traveled. Yeah. Um. Or maybe maybe it's even 
like let's let's rank them in there they are like all these six cards are placed or are ranked first place yeah and but maybe i would even i would even open a whole new s tier or stir the pot and the card is actually so much better than it looks like okay and because in some matchups it's just so relevant to um, shuffle your deck when mm -hmm. you already transcend it a couple of times, yeah, and just draw into the tree earlier again. Yeah, um, that's also something I did in the finals against Zen. I yeah. banished it, stir the pot from their deck, and yeah. then I just played it to shuffle back. Like I played the strike and put in. Put a chi card back into my deck and then shuffled with their sturdy pot just because i really like drawing them as yeah. early as possible oh yeah right and you you did that before you had actually played a blue right yeah exactly um, before yeah, they, yeah. They before there um, was a blue because then they would have transcended and gotten the chi but in this case you just shuffled yeah makes sense yeah and also in the in the top eight match uh, which was the mirror against another new i also Banished there, stir the pot, and used it. And I think that is part of what won me the game there. Okay. So I think stir the pot is actually so cracked. <laughs> okay. That's cool. I like the card. Like, I've been kind of lukewarm on it at first because, like, shuffle your deck doesn't look like it does much. Uh, but yeah, I think if you draw it in that kind of like mid game spot where you've already pitched, like, maybe four chi or something. And then you just have a way to make sure that you draw those chi back up and you have a higher density of chi in your deck, essentially. Um, so you can activate mask more consistently. And also, like, I mean, drawing a chi that is already transcended is oftentimes a lot better than just drawing a transcend card, right? Because then you don't have to worry yeah. about activating it. You can just go like, okay, I have a chi. I can just, you know, pitch that to mask and I can go like leave no witnesses with a mask on top of it without having to worry about transcending the card. So definitely very yeah. good. And well, then in, in some matchups, obviously, Passover is just the best transcend card. Yeah. Like if, if it's relevant, it's very good. And if yeah. it's not relevant, it's it kind of does not nothing. Yeah. And same is kind of true for the sacred art, but mm -hmm. you really have to have time to play it. So yeah. in some methods, it's unplayable. For example, in Zen, I would play all the transcend card except sacred yeah. art. The the three and cost is just kind of like a big barrier to it being good. I think, yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. That makes sense. So basically. And yeah, the ones that don't need a target are better than the ones that do. And then obviously it's like kind of ranked by how relevant they are for the specific matchup in question. But would you say that you run seven out of the eight into most and then basically sacred art um, into the matchups that give you the space to do it? So maybe like, I don't know, Guardian or something, right? Now, I think I run like five into every matchup. Okay. And I think that's like, Homage to ancestors, path well traveled, preserved tradition, rising sun, and stir the pot might be even mainboard cards. Okay. But they are in the sideboard for practical reasons because that way I always have to find them after the match and put them back ah, into my sideboard, and that way you. I can never forget to DG. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's yeah. moving all in the sideboard. That's actually that's pretty. Possibly. That's that's pretty clever, actually. Yeah, because I have them in the main board, the ones that are run, and I always I do the same thing. I go through my deck and I, I fish out everything that's a sideboard card, right? Uh, and if you just put your chi in that slot too, basically, you mentally just have that. Okay, I need to find my chi, and then you automatically see if any of them are still flipped. Uh, that's actually that's a, a, a neat even way of doing. Even if you do forget to flip them. Uh, the moment when you sight them in, you yeah. would always flip them back. So you see it again and you go like, oh, damn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually smart. So that's why they are in the sideboard, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually. It's yeah, you... just practical reasons and not gameplay reasons. Yeah, you don't want to get like a penalty for, for getting to DG, right? Um, so that makes sense, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then let's go over the rest of the, the sideboard cards. So we have Sync below here. 
uh, and fate for scene. So you run six defense reactions. And I, I would say like the standard ones, just a zero for fours, right? Um, I have seen people arguing that running D reacts in new is actually bad. And just running like more, like cutting the D reacts allows you to run more offense and be more aggressive. Um, I, I, I'm personally not sure I, I agree with that take. I run like sync below and then instead of hate for scene, I decided to run inertia trap. Um, but I can see both. Um, I think they're, they're yeah. both like valid inclusions and it just, again, that's like personal preference, which one you prefer. Right. I think inertia trap is the, like the obvious contender versus fate for scene. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like those three are by far the best defense reactions we have. Yep. Um, I also tested like red unmovables because our blue count is so high, but yep. they ended up being clunky because yeah. you never want to pitch your blaze in your opponent's turn. Yeah. At least it felt like that to me. So um, it was... For me, it was obvious to play zero cost defense reactions. Yep. Um, and I thought like, well, then is the deck to beat. Yeah. And I don't want to have inertia trap into Zen because, as I said, I feel like they can convert their hand anyway. Yeah. So that's inertia true. oftentimes just doesn't really disrupt them. Yeah. Or doesn't that disrupt them too much at least? And yeah. then I just want like. As you said earlier, we have this, um, we, we, or we have these weird games where they come through and they can break through your disruption, play an out of water and deal 30 damage or something, and you end up dropping down to 10 or 12. Yeah. And in those scenarios, you play awkward mid range games and um, having fate for scenes and sink belows then might actually help you if you plan to fatigue them okay so just the idea of okay i get a little bit extra value defensively just because i can block for four instead of three and maybe those like one or two life points are enough to you know make up the difference and survive long enough to fatigue okay yeah that makes sense yes and then there is the like the third deck that's azalea and yep. i think against azalea you also or you're not actually sad about having a couple of defense reactions. Yeah, I agree. Um, but I think into Azilia, Inertia Trap would be the better one, probably. Mm -hmm. Because yep. Inertia Trap against an Endless Arrow is amazing. Yeah, agreed. Um, however, that's why I also included the Warmongers, yep. three copies of that. Because first of all, I have to board out six blues into new into the mirror so yep. i need some more blues to like replace them yep. and have a like keep the ratios as they are Makes and sense. also it's another hate card into azilia and yep. i think without them the matchup is just too hard for me okay makes sense well and the looking for scraps are basically just yeah they're just like too good i think this tribute this... tribute to enigma i think yeah. i I bought them only into Enigma and maybe some Warriors or something. Okay. But in most uh, matchups, they just stay in the sideboard. Okay. Because I think the go wide thing is not what I need against most of the decks. Okay. I, I like looking you... for a scrap into a lot of decks, actually, just because it, I, I, at some point, like you, you need to kill most decks, I think. And looking for a scrap is a very reliable way of doing that because they are never going to block it, right? Like looking for a scrap is just deal five against basically every deck unless you yeah. have like no other cards. But I can see uh, leaving it in the sideboard against like the more uh, aggressive decks because it only blocks two and then only dealing like five vanilla even though it's a very above rate card, you know, in terms of like what Assassin can do um it just doesn't matter like a zen is just gonna take five and call it a day they don't care um so putting exactly. the card like, in your deck I think, yeah i think we are more like or at least i understand new more of a control deck and yeah. looking for scrap doesn't really support my game plan and as okay. you said no one would ever block this thing yeah that's true and 
I actually want my cards to be blocked. Yeah. So okay. looking for strap is like a card that, yeah, like doesn't support what I try to do. Okay, right. Like it doesn't support your primary game plan. So it's like a sideboard hate piece that you run specifically for like Kano, Azalea, not Azalea, Kano, Enigma, you know, stuff like that. Okay, that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I mean, against Kano, obviously. It's yeah. Great. Like you just run every extender you can get your hands on, right? Uh, I also like it against obviously like Guardian, Prism, you know, like generally all of the decks that you just need to kill as fast as possible. Uh, I guess like Tekla Vossen would be another um, uh, another one where you would run this card. I, I don't think that it's especially great against Tekla Vossen because it gives them a way to use their equipment. Mm, sure. Okay. Yeah. Makes sense. Like, but the thing about Tekla Vossen is mm -hmm. they can't ever block your stealth attack. Yeah. With sure. Equipment and. Well, if you slam a looking for scrap, that's like they just immediately block with equipment. Yeah. They don't even have to fear a shred. Yeah, just to get the value. It's yeah. generic, and they would immediately get value out of their equipment. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. So I don't, I'm not sold on the card. Maybe you would still board them. Yeah. But to be honest, I not played a single game into Tekla Wasn, I think. Yeah, it's not not a very common deck at the moment, uh, or like ever. I think um, there was like this weird spot towards like the tail end of the heavy hitters meta where you were starting to see a couple of Tekla Um But I think like part the Mist Veil vale has just kind of put him into the background again because like all three Mystic decks are good against Tekla Vossen. Like, he doesn't disrupt enough to have a chance against Zen. Enigma is obviously, like, a nightmare for him to deal with because board state-based decks, are they just beat Teklavasen because he's slower than them and he tries to do kind of the same thing, right? Um, and then Nu obviously has, like, the specific interactions with stealth cards that make the matchup kind of very awkward for him to deal with. Um, so, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And then, yeah, well, you already talked about uh, Warmongers um, as, like, it's just another blue. So you have, like, the same ratios into the mirror and you have an Azalea hate piece. And then finally, is Siren's Call, which, in my opinion, is a strong contender for the best card in the deck. Maybe that's a bit of a hot take, but it's obviously not no, relevant I mean against every deck. But the decks against which it is relevant, it's extremely good in my experience. Yes, I think I agree on that spot. Like, if it's good, then it's amazing. Yeah. Like it, it's amazing into Enigma, it's amazing into Zen, into Brutes, yep. into Guardians. Yep. Um, but I still put it into my sideboard, though, because... I would not board it into, I don't know, Bolton or Prism. Yeah, or like Azalea mm -hmm. or Riptide, yeah. you know. Yes, exactly. They don't, so, they don't run enough blues for it to be relevant, unfortunately, yeah. But if, if they run like, I I think into non-Bolton Warriors, it's also a good card. Yeah. Like, if they run like 20 blues, it's, yep. it's so great. Normally you just take a card from their hand and yep. draw another card. It is not a high cost. Yeah. Um, and if they don't have a blue in their hand for some reason, their turn is probably not as not as great. Not anyways, as great anyways. Yeah. I think I might not want to play it into into Phi maybe. Okay. Yeah. I can. I. I don't know. Like I think my my personal cutoff um, would be like fifteen blues, right? Like if the opponent stack plays. 15 blues or more, I think I would try to board in Siren's Call because that's like the 15 is the threshold where they build their blue base around typically having one blue every hand. And if you take that blue away, it typically impacts their turn in a big way and they can't play their hand the way they want to, right? But against decks with 15, and I think that's like five basically runs typically 15-ish blues. Um, I think that's uh, uh, it can obviously whiff, right? And then Fi specifically can have turns where even with no blues, he can still output a lot of damage. So 
I don't know. Yeah, that. that's what I was thinking as yeah, well. Yeah, so yeah. maybe it's not correct to board it into five, but at the moment I would like. Yeah, I'm just not sure if it's correct. Yeah, I, I was I, I played against uh, a dash um, at the nationals actually, and I was thinking it would be like the the typical mid range start with chamber dash, right? The the more common build. And then uh, it was actually a Hanabi dash, and I had boarded in Siren's Call, and I think he ran like I don't know five blues or something. Yeah, I mean then it's and the card was that. just useless. So I, I played it out once, and then I caught <laughs> on to what exactly they were doing, and I just started blocking with the rest of them because they were just useless, and I knew I, I would never hit anything with them. But that was actually a surprisingly close game. Um, because the Hanabi list can just output so much damage so consistently, uh, it can be actually kind of hard to to stop them from overwhelming you. Um, kind of kind of interesting list, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I think against uh, Hanabi Blaster or something like that high aggro list, yeah. you don't have too many spots where you can take damage to do something. Yeah, and like if you waste one of your one of your take damage jokers to play a siren's call it might be come very close maybe yeah yeah yeah. yeah. i don't know definitely like the, the thing is i was just not expecting them to run this few blues i hadn't caught up with the meta like i know that this is kind of like the list that they play now to counter zen uh where they just play like rainbow t-bones and hanabi and a lot of boost cards and, and then they just kind of race them down um but yeah i i just didn't expect the game to be played out that way because the dash that the dash that i know typically run like the mid-rangey list uh with the chamber pistol build and then they just kind of try to adapt to what you're doing right if you play aggressive they play aggressive if you play defensive they start to focus more on the pistol uh, and that against that list i think sirens call is extremely good because that list runs like 20 blues or so um and then the the cards is very good but against the hanabi list uh, it's trash so yeah. i think i would I mean, still i i think I, it's, it yeah. skips that turn. exactly yeah most of the time yeah i think i would still run it against the dash be because i don't know what version they're running but if i see hanabi i'm just gonna focus on blocking with it right it blocks three so you know it's all good you need to block a lot against that list anyways um, so I think it's fine to have the card in, in the list, even against a Hanabi dash, unless you're like absolutely sure it's going to be Hanabi because you scouted them or something, um, against like an unknown dash, I think I would still side it in. Yeah. Yes. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, that takes care of the entire deck, uh, and we can, um, look at the matchups a little bit. Um, I'm not going to go over every single one of these. Like, Bino has been nice enough to actually, you know, go through the trouble of putting these all up for you. So if any of you want to run this list, um, obviously I'm going to link to it in the description of the video. You can check it out. And the uh, sideboarding is all taken care of. So you can just, um, on Talishar, you can just load it up, uh, click the relevant hero, and then just, you know, go from there. And if you have, like, some ideas about it, um, obviously you can, you know, adapt to that so like i said yeah i'm not gonna go over every single one of these but is there anything where you would say you need to explain your sideboarding choices maybe is there anything that stands out to you or would you just say these are like kind of self-explanatory uh once you understand what the deck is trying to do i think many of them are self-explained but maybe we should well first of all talk about the mirror a little bit because sure. i mean you know it i know it maybe not everyone knows it that it's actually a very crucial part of the mirror to um board out all the blues that are too good yep and so levels of enlightenment has to leave yep. the deck 100 and also the second tenant of chi moon mm -hmm. felt like like it's obviously not the best blue in the deck it's yep. not better than surgical or something, yep. but if you don't have to pay for it and yeah. it's just a five, uh, like five power draw card, yeah, that's just too good for a zero pitch and spend nothing card. Yeah, well, I mean surgical also is great if you don't have to pay for it. Yeah, but 
you also cannot play without Surge Lethal because it's your main plan. Yeah, I, I think and... I've, I've seen some lists boarding out Surgical in the mirror, and I think I get the reasoning behind it, uh, but I just think, like you said, Surgical is too good not to run, essentially. Um, yes, I I think so too. Yeah. Um, I don't even know. Did I did I include the mirror? Uh, yeah, yeah, you did. It's I here. Did. Like mirror, preferred turner okay. goes second, and then. You take out levels and second tenet of Chi Moon, and you bring yeah, and in the warmongers just so your blue base stays the same. So that makes sense. Yes. So I mean, you might wonder like, why would you bring warmongers in the matchup? It's not yeah. because it's a sideboard card. It's just because it's a you titanium bomb. You need the blue count, basically. Yeah. Yes. And then also because oh, we we talked a lot about enlightened strike earlier, so maybe yep. we should. Elaborate on the Levinger matchup. Okay, yeah. Um, because, I mean, this is like the one matchup where I don't want to play Enlightened Strike. Okay. Uh, and basically, it's like for the same reason as uh, with Tech Lovosn earlier. Like, you don't want to play generic attacks into Levinger. They can just block it with two cards. And right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fill their, fill their graveyard that way. If okay. you send e strike for seven, they yep. just don't care. They block with two cards. Yep. They get two cards in their graveyard. And, well, that's actually helping them. Okay, that so, makes sense. Yeah. So that is why I want to, like, I don't want to have e strike and looking for scrap yep. in these kind of matchups because they are just five go again or seven or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way you win into Levia is you banish, like, they they can't fill their graveyard because yeah. all the cards they block your stealth cards with which with are banished. Yep. And then you have a random pass over and sacred art to banish a couple of more cards. Yep. And they eventually have to really jump through some hoops uh, yeah. to get rid of their blood depth. Yeah. While you also disrupt them, like you yep. take their blue. You, you take their blue with a siren's call, then you activate mask, and yeah, yeah. maybe they just don't have the the hand after your disruption to get rid of their blood tap. It's very and, rough for them actually like, to to play that matchup. Yeah, um, for sure. Yes, but if you if you like try to play too much of a value game and like try to annoy them with e strikes, it's probably just favoring them okay after that because it so especially if you do it early yeah it gives them too much space to to actually utilize their cards defensively yeah makes sense yeah so that's maybe why i wanted to wanted to elaborate a little bit about uh, on that matchup because okay. that might be not as not as obvious yeah like I, I would have, I would have not, uh, not made that connection. I think, like, I mean, not boarding and looking for a scrap, I think, makes sense because it's like, you know, two block, and you kind of need like the Vaya can still put out a lot of damage, um, if you let her. So I think that makes sense. But I, I think I would have left in Enlightened Strike for sure in the in the matchup just because it's a good like mid range trading card, and sometimes that's all you need to do to win against the brute, right? It's like have some consistent value. Um, but your reasoning makes perfect sense where you don't actually want to give them a chance to convert their their hands like defensively to fill up the graveyard. And like, yeah, that's absolutely the win. The way to win against Levia is to just mess up their graveyard as much as possible. Like you can also do it with your hero ability, right? Because they play a bunch of these blues that are not hits for them. Stuff like um uh alehorn right or like barraging beatdown i think is still in a lot of levia lists that i've seen and then if you activate I mean, your hero ability and they have a couple of these in the banished zone you can put them back in their graveyard and just really mess up their their graveyard ratios yeah i mean that also depends sometimes it's just good to not do it because because their graveyard is a very low count and yeah. sometimes you actually do help them if you if you added blue dread screamer to their graveyard and yeah. sometimes the blue dread screamer is what they really don't want in their graveyard yeah. so they, you... 
it depends again we're depends coming again yeah. we're coming back to that yeah <laughs> that's just a, a common theme i think um in in uh in assassin yeah um and yeah maybe maybe we talk about a prism for a second here because i see that you board out the sirens call against prism and that's a, a card i've been like back and forth on that actually against prism where it's like like it seems logical to board it out because they run mostly yellows and but i think it, it depends a lot on the prism list in question they do run quite a few blues and if they do run the blues usually they really want the blues on their turn because they unlock some of their better lines if they have a blue in there yeah um, i think it depends too much on their list actually. yeah that's it, true it can be very irrelevant and against prison like all your cards have to be relevant yeah okay relevant yeah it yeah. feels like to me but it's it's a tough contender like i bought in three uh stick belows yep. into prison yeah because i like to cover up an erudition with that yep so i think it's actually not terrible arsenal in, for sure into yeah. prison yeah like it's a bit strange because normally with assassin you want to like play as aggressively as possible into illusionists yeah and uh, well like having a sink below that you put into your arsenal and hope to snipe in a herald is kind of like contradicting to that game plan but i think prism has too many seven attacks yeah that gonna, you exactly have to block out yep yep, like, yep. I mean, if they hit with a herald, it's not not the end of the world. But if they hit, hit with a herald and it's their first chain link, that yeah, is what is exactly. problematic. Like that's usually so, my, my game plan into Prism is typically like try to block out the first herald as much as possible. Yeah, the, the second doesn't matter. And the second one doesn't matter as much exactly. Like that's my my go to strategy against them as well. And then if they if their first herald is like herald of triumph. Um, and you you happen to have a popper or something, it just feels bad. I mean, your list runs like minimal amount of poppers. You really just have the three CNC, right? Um, but a lot of lists are running stuff like weakest link. In addition to that, for example, uh, I've seen uh, red blanche actually in a couple of lists too, um, specifically as a tech against prism because it's very good in that specific matchup. Uh, also yeah, a great I mean, card in the mirror yeah. actually. I, I also had uh, red blanches in my list yeah. for very long. Yeah. And, well, the moment that red blanches were kicked out of the list uh, was like five minutes before the players' meeting. And I oh, crossed okay. out the blanches from my list uh, for looking for scraps because oh, okay. I had the gut feeling to face an enigma. Yeah, makes sense. And it, yeah, like paid, Red Blanche is like the one that I would consider the most. Yep. Because I don't want to actively improve the Zen matchup, which is favored anyway. I think it's not like two to one favored like other new lists. Maybe yep. my list is like 60-40 into yep. Zen. But I don't want to add a card just to improve the zen matchup so that's why i'm not on amnesia that's why i'm not on okay. sensor or weakest link weakest link yeah and okay like blanche would be the one i would consider most because it's actively good into prism yeah and also good in mirror okay that makes sense yeah all right so yeah okay now with with that um reasoning i think all of these card decisions make perfect sense right I think it's just like assassin has always been a class where you need to know what to expect in order to build your deck right you can't just go like a zen deck where you go okay my game plan is going to be spam bonds so i run rainbow bonds and then i build the rest of my deck around that and i don't really care what the rest of the meta does i just try to maximize my own game plan right and with assassin i think you always have to be a little bit more reactive in terms of deck building where you go okay that's the meta i expect and then i i, I run specific cards to counter that right uh, so you run stuff like warmongers if you expect azalea etc right 
Um, so yeah, you, I, you, I agree. You need to be a bit more reactive. All right. Okay. So that takes care of the deck and uh, all of the matchups and sideboard stuff. And if any of you have any questions about sideboarding, right, um, you can just leave them down in the comments below the video and then we'll try to answer them um, and, you know, explain the reasoning behind specific sideboard choices that way, right? Because I think going over every single one of these would just take up too much time right now. So instead... How about we just hop into a uh, practice match and just see how that list actually operates in uh, an actual game of Flesh and Blood. So uh, got a list loaded Let's up here on Telashar. I'm going to go with Request Undo CC because I feel that's like where you typically get like the highest quality of gameplay usually. Um, and let's, yeah, just let's, see. let's just see what we get. Uh, a Kano, lovely. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> lovely. Okay, um, do you want to go first or second? Uh, we have to go second. Second, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, so we're gonna hit them with the good luck, have fun, and then we press the Kano button here. So yeah, like yeah, we were mean, talking we about. Have a, hmm? We can have a look at the sideboard again, yep. but I mean, obviously, we play all the Airb pieces, yes. and well. What we don't want is defense reactions, Makes and sense. what we also don't want is warmongers. So yep. that's quite obvious. Yep. I think that that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, they seem to be unlike the standard build that I would expect. Um, nothing, nothing too specific. Uh, we don't have any turn zero gameplay actions, so we just pass here and just see what they do. Yeah, we just try to prevent as much as yep. possible. With the AB3. Uh, okay, so he found an energy potion off the top. Um, That's a pretty I good know, start I think, for them. I think that was from hand, actually, but... Uh, yeah, pretty good for them. So they just pass, they don't hit us, they don't allow us to scout their hand a little bit, which I think is smart. Yeah, but I mean... There's I not really anything we can do about that. Yeah, I think we just go like... Uh, Play surgical, and then Siren's Call, right? And just pull a blue from their hand, and then Arsenal are looking for a scrap. What do you think? Um, I think that's probably the best play. Yep. Okay. I mean, Kano can just like Kano in response to any kind of hand disruption, right? So it's not super helpful. He did pitch an Ether Wildfire, so they're already setting up a stack, right? At least, yeah, it seems like that. Yeah. Like, they didn't even bother to play the the lessons. So. Yeah. Okay, so he's uh, blocking for nine here. Yeah, I would still go with the I think we still, we, we still send a Siren's Call. Like, either he doesn't have a blue here. That's fine. Uh, oh, that's oh, very Nice, good. that's actually a very good hit. It's interesting that he didn't pitch that to Kano um honestly but yeah uh yeah i think what we do here hang on so he has a lesson is in lava banished do we path here i don't think so right and we could push an extra damage here i mean we could still play looking for a scrap just to deal four yeah that's fair like dagger and then looking for a scrap i think that's actually not bad yeah i mean that's five more damage i think yep. i think that's worth it probably yeah that's worth Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So because we... looking for a scrap will not deal more than five damage. Yeah. And, and then we don't have to worry about setting it up because it's kind of hard to get the stealth cards into graveyard against Kano sometimes. No, that's... It's not too hard, I think, because... Um, because you actively want to play them out. It's yeah. not like... In Ozuri, where you play your blue isolate and want to switch it out, yeah, yeah. you really want to play your blue stealth attacks. True. So I think that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is fine. Yeah. So like, th this is not ideal, obviously, right? Seeing all of these looking no. for scraps in the early game um, is not great. No, so. Not. Uh, I would still go with uh, pitching codex for the misplayed. Uh -huh. and then attack with the Art of, Art of Desire because it might still draw a card. 
Yep. And if it draws a card, we can even break the chain and banish it. Play looking, looking for a scrap. scrap, yeah. Okay, so he's uh, blocking the Scalding Rain here. I think that makes sense. Yeah, I think I would still go with the, the Art yeah, of Desire. Yeah, just, just set it up um, so we have a target for those looking for scraps, actually. So I think that makes sense. And he's probably going to double block this. Just no, to play, maybe so. single block it, just to play around like a hiss or a venomous bite. Also, they probably have blue actions and can't really afford to block it. Ah, but he, they do he anyway. does block it with a zap. Okay, that's kind of interesting. But I mean, we don't have go again, and I don't think we crack uh, stilettos here. So no, no, not not for not that. In this spot. Yep, yep. Okay, so we just arsenal. Here the... might be he might be a good like educational moment for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, if for, uh, like if the path well traveled would not be out of our deck yeah. you always have to hold priority uh -huh. when you hit with an art of desire because you might draw in path well traveled to give yep. it go again true so we in are our case it's irrelevant well. because it's already out of our deck yeah okay so he pitches a tome definitely stacking so that's a tome and then wildfire and a, a blue in between i think I don't know how exactly he ordered that. I think he pitched like two blues, a wildfire, and now he pitched a Tome of Either Wind. So definitely setting up a yeah. stack here. So, uh, okay, I think we start with looking for a scrap um, into, let's see. We start with looking for a scrap for sure. So we pitched a blue yeah, here. Yeah, I think we pitched the blue. Yeah. And see what what they do. Yep. Okay, block three. I'm tempted to just go like uh, E strike five. Go again. Leave no witnesses. Maybe. Yeah, I think so too. Because we don't have fuel definitely... for the other looking for a scrap, so it, it would be. Yeah, we can bottom that. Yeah, might be a bit clunky. So we just go. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we deal two. E strike five go again, and then if they block here again, we can actually weave in a dagger because we're not yeah, gonna need the other two resources. Yeah, if they for some reason just don't block anything, I yeah. would probably hold the two resources. Yes, just absolutely. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, they don't block anything here, so they they probably yeah, think that we have a disruptive piece. What do you think, dagger or not? No, I don't think I would throw in a dagger then. Yeah, I think we leave I, the two I up. I would just no witness. Yep, I think that's just safer here, yeah. Don't get too greedy. Okay, easy I mean, block six. But they, they're... They, are trying to, they are trying to pitch stack, and they already lost 12 life points in the first three yeah. turns or so. I mean... And they also blocked with a blazing, so that's pretty good for us. They lost one of their e-pots, so they won't be able to set up three of those. That's pretty good. I can work with that. Okay, they pitch a wildfire. Okay, so that's the second one in their pitch stack now. So their their pitch stack is like what's that? Uh, wildfire, two blues, tome, uh, wildfire, something like that. Yeah. So. Um, okay, so I think my line here is Codex of Frailty. Uh, bring back looking for a scrap, discard bonds of agony, play it with the rowdy, and then CNC. What do you think? Just to threaten 11. Um, I have to think a bit about that. Yep, hang on. Just gonna let them know that we're thinking a bit about the line. I mean, I don't love discarding a bonds, yeah. to be honest. Like so, the, the thing is, we can't really turn it live here. And yeah, but they don't know that for sure, but... No, I mean, you're right on that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think Codex of Frailty isn't as relevant in this matchup. Mm -hmm. So I would maybe even... I would maybe even try to just uh, go with the misplayed 
Okay. Fishing bonds and then hit with the rowdy locals. Okay. If they let it hit. And if not, we send the CNC or. Yeah. If they don't let it hit, we send the CNC and it's totally fine. Okay. Or maybe they block the dagger and then we just send CNC and Arsenal the codec. Uh, Okay, sure. Yep. That works. That is probably what I would do. Okay. I think they're gonna block this pretty. I, I think I. I don't know. Like I. I would have been down to try the the codex for another looking for a scrap line just because it's. It, I think it it maximizes the damage we can deal. Um. But yeah. Okay. So they block the dagger. Which means we pitch Rowdy for CNC and then we Arsenal the Codex, right? Yeah, or maybe we even activate the letters and Codex for Leave No Witness. Um, okay, Depending that works too. Yep, 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 yep. That works too. Sure. So we go CNC here. But that depends on how desperately they want to yeah let's, their arsenal. let's see what they do with their arsenal for sure they do want I, their that the, arsenal no nah, i think i think they didn't give us the relevant cards so i i think we are just fine with that because okay just pass pass yep okay sure we got enough yeah like if they give us a wild like if they give us a wildfire or something or maybe I have because a feeling. I have a feeling that last wildfire is sitting in Arsenal right now. Actually, or maybe so. it's just maybe it's just a sink below mm. in Arsenal, and in that case, so they activate Kano here, banish Ether Flare in the turn. Okay, that's it, and they banished. Uh, they pitched uh, Gaze the Ages. Okay, so that's on the bottom now. Uh, okay, run. so we have Codex here. Um, I think what we can do is we. Pitch to levels, right? And we choose a uh, draw card. Draw card. And then his and for go again, and then just see what happens. We can venomous bite codex potentially into CNC. Yeah, I think that's a good line. Yep. So we go draw a card, submit. And because they it's another already... venomous bite. Interesting. Oh. That kind of bricks up the codex, unfortunately, but. Still fine. Yeah, it's not because terrible. We can go his. Yeah. And then play codex. Discard the venomous bite or? Discard one venomous bite. Yeah. And pitch the other for a CNC. Okay, sure. Or we play Venomous Bite and grab a Leave No Witnesses. Also an option. Like we just discard the Venomous option, Bite for like no they value. Might, they, might, they might have a defense reaction in their arsenal. It would at least hmm. make sense with the way they played. Sure. Uh, let's see. I'm, I don't know. Like I... Th- I mean, the Venomous Bite is like an extra four damage here. I think that's that's pretty relevant. Mm. Well, but... If they have a D-React, uh, you're right. We haven't seen them play any D-React so far. And they've been sitting on that arsenal for a long, 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 long time so far. I don't know. I, th- I think they would have used it earlier, maybe. But, yeah, may- maybe you're right. Let's Let's go with the CNC line. Um, I'm not opposed to that. Yeah, I mean, if they take 12 here... Ah, they do have a sink. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. If they take 12, uh, go go down to 12 here. We're also not super sad about that. So So they have used the sink, so they do run D-Reacts. Do you think they have another one in Arsenal here? I think that's... That's my call, at least. That's the question. Okay, that's fair, yeah. But I think you would always use the one from Arsenal first, not the one from hand, right? 
I don't know. Ah, they have a snag. Okay, they have snag in Arsenal. That's actually, that's very interesting. Okay, sure. Okay, I think that doesn't really change anything. Yeah, no, but it does mean we do definitely play the CNC now because, you know, the venomous yeah. bites would be useless now. So, okay, interesting. Very interesting. Snag, snag is a weird inclusion. In but... Kano for sure, yeah. Um... Maybe we actually, go do we surgical? actually do we take the yeah do we take the C and C here? We could also run surgical. I think um, surgical is the better one because yeah. they already committed their defense reaction. Yeah, makes sense. They might have another one, but yep. At least if they have another one, they would just block the C and C and arsenal it. Yep. So. Okay, the tunic. Do they run oasis? Yeah. They do run oasis. Okay. All right. Interesting. Sure. Okay, so they took no damage. Yep. That one, I think, I wouldn't arsenal. You wouldn't arsenal this. Yeah. Maybe, I think maybe if, we if we have stilettos yeah, we still up, I think it's we fine. Do. We do. I yeah. think we do. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so they activate Kano, get another blue on the bottom, and play out the second e pot. Okay, so it's not looking too good for us right now. Um. Yeah, so we dagger here. I think we do dagger first. With the With Art of the... Desire, yeah. Okay. And uh, I think just playing out the second tenant now is yeah. probably yeah. the best value. Uh, over pitch, I think, with the leave now, right? Yes, yeah. And then just, yeah, just do it that way. Would have been nice if we had a chi on this hand. Because I think then we could have cracked uh, stilettos, but I think right now it's not really worth it. Okay, ether flare. They take two. That's quite good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the order of these on the bottom doesn't really matter. No, because they're. Matchup. We are not seeing chi. Like that's that's pretty bad, actually. Like, it's not coming up. Okay, they just pass an arsenal a card. So okay. that's probably that's a D react for sure. Probably. So we just start with an dagger. Misplayed. Yep. And they're gonna block that because they're not in their pitch stack yet. I think we have two more turns. Maybe three because they haven't pit been pitching a lot, and they also played only a single they were, sink. So there are like only eight cards or so in the pitch. Mm -hmm. So I think we should have plenty of time left. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I think we run out the prognosis here. Yeah, and hope they overblock. Yep, and then we crack boots amount. into leave no witnesses. If they block six here. I think Boots into leave no is not a great play if we okay. if we think they have a defense. Yeah, that's Arsenal. that's fair actually. Yeah, that's fair. Okay, so they only block it for a single card. Um, hmm. What do you think? Yeah, maybe we still, we still have to do it. I think. To I, th I think we kind of have, have to do it to force the D react out. Yeah. Because we're running out of time here. Uh, we could actually hit the second tenant of Chi here, maybe. Or do we run the leaf now? I think I would go with leave now, right? 
Maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe the second tenant isn't too bad. Okay. Just just for five. Presenting yeah. more damage. Yeah. Maybe they still play the direct and take one. Yep. They might. Yeah, I think they are. Yep. There we go. Ah, it was from hand actually, not from Arsenal, but yeah, still the correct call I think, because the Levna would have just been like flat blocked. Uh, they do not sink, I think. They haven't sunk anything, yeah. Okay. Okay, double sirens call. Still, that's still no transcend card. Still no transcend card. Yeah, that's that's kind of unfortunate. Okay. But I think I would go with. That's a tough call. That is a tough call. Yeah. Uh, maybe surgical into sirens, and then yeah, we maybe, can maybe that's correct. And we can use the other sirens then, or we could even go leave no into sirens. But that's kind of like nah. I think we go surgical. It's it's wasting too much resources. Yeah. I think. I think so too. Yeah. I mean, we could have gotten like dagger into leave no into double surgical something like that. But um, let's see. So we played a surgical. They might just pitch to Kano here. Oh no, they have a snag. Okay. And the other card was a red ether flare. So that doesn't do anything. So we don't need to play the other sirens call. Uh, sure, yeah. They probably just wanted to play out the snag instead, which like, you know, achieves the same purpose. So. I mean, we don't, draw, we don't draw a card. We don't draw a card, but in this case, it doesn't matter, right? So, Because the snag is gone for no value. They don't know that, but it, it doesn't make a difference. So they have a red ether flare, so they're probably going to pitch that to ether weave on their turn. Okay. Okay, double trouble with just a nick and sirens is actually pretty good. Yeah, that might be a good hand, finally. That's that's pretty okay, yeah. But still no transcend cards. Still no transcend cards. Yeah, that's kind of weird. We're like definitely halfway through the deck and we've seen, I think, two of them so far. <laughs> yeah, in the first hand. That's that's but, pretty bad. Okay, so I think we go like dagger into double trouble, right? Yeah, um, we go dagger. Double trouble, just the Nick Sirens with the one floating. And if they actually let the dagger hit this time, uh, we can follow that up with a leave now. So I think if they if they try to block the dagger, there's an argument for just playing just the uh, Sirens call here. Just here, yeah. That makes sense, actually, yeah. 100%. Because it makes their block so much more inefficient. Yep. Absolutely, yes, I agree. Uh, the problem is we can't turn on the double trouble now, but... Yeah, but I mean, if they we, block. For if we do less. draw a chi, so they had what? Uh, Ether Flare, Ether Arc, Gaze the Ages. So I key, Gaze is the one that I want to take here because they want that on the bottom. Yeah. So we're drawing yeah, that in for sure. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> now now okay, we're talking. Okay, now we're talking. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That is pretty good. And double trouble. Please enjoy this. <laughs> And, and we wasted their snag last turn, but yeah. they might have another one in Arsenal. They might have another one in Arsenal, yeah. But I think we... Uh, no, go. they actually, I don't think they do, because they played the snag from Arsenal. No, that was from hand, actually, yeah. Okay, so they're okay. snap blocking six I think we still here. go for it. Yeah, Get we just go 13, for it. Seven. Uh, we just do both. We pass it back to them. They don't do anything. We do the same thing again. Yeah, deal seven, mill four. The downside is mill four might actually be good for them. So there might be an argument for just yeah. making plus five on the just nick. Yeah. Okay, we hit the last snag, so that's gone. We don't need to play around that anymore. That's good. Okay, there's the transcend. Okay, that's actually pretty decent. Let's see, what do they have in Banish that we can actually play? They do have a Scalding Rain, that's two damage, it's not terrible. Ether Quickening too. 
not amazing, all of these, but let's see. Okay, so we have Bonds, we have just the Nick. We're lacking one reaction to turn Bonds on. That's a bit unfortunate. Um, but I think, how, how do you want to play this? We start with levels, maybe? But then we have to pitch the Bonds? I don't know. What do you think? There's one Bonds left in our deck, right? Yes. And after that. Uh, two so, actually, we pitched one in the early game, so we have. Yeah, I mean, like one that is not pitched. Yeah, that's. There's true. one yes. yeah, left yeah. in our first cycle. I mean. Yeah, so, yeah, that is correct. Yeah. I mean, they are at nine. Mm -hmm. But they're also almost in their pitch stack. Like within the next one or two cycles, I think they're gonna hit their pitch stack. And they have right. double wildfire. They have two e pods. They have a tome in so there that we I saw. Think the, even though we are desperately, we have been desperately waiting for the transcend card. I think the yeah. most efficient play is still pitch the homage to a dagger and yeah. then levels. Yeah, and eventually playing a leave no from Arsenal. Okay, Arsenal in order to the set bonds. up the stuff in your deck. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense, yeah. And then we are so the bonds is... keep the just Nick. Yeah, or vice versa, maybe. Okay. Yeah, maybe just keeping the be... maybe keeping yeah, the blue in hand. Blue. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because sense. what we want to draw here is a his of animus bite. And yep. if we draw it together with another bonds, it might be yep. good and have extra blues. Yeah, okay, makes sense, yeah. Okay, they're still blocking, so they still haven't hit their stack. That makes sense. Yeah, so I think we just go with levels go again and leave yep. no. Yep. Yeah, I think that's smart. We keep another blue. They're just going to block this for three. Yep. And I think we have one more turn, don't we? I think we have one more, yeah, but that's probably the last one. Yeah, they have another oasis. They're actually pitching to the oasis to get the blazing on the bottom. That's actually interesting because that's not really in their stack right now. I now, think. the thing is, they probably want to keep the tunic resource for mm -hmm. the combo turn. For the combo turn, that makes sense, yeah. So we Arsenal the Nick, keep the blue? I think so. Yep, all right, let's go. Ah, uh, still not great. Still not great. Um, What do we do with this? We lack one reaction. How do we play this? I think... We have seen two sirens calls so far. Yeah. Uh, three actually, I think. We saw all three. All three? One, two, three. One. Yep. We've seen one hiss and two yep. venomous bites. Yes. Right? So now Three more. Yep. Plus one plus the Nick, I think. That's uh, no, we have one in Arsenal and two that we played on the double oh, triple, right. so the Knicks are gone. So, what are the odds to draw one of them? Pretty decent, but how are we drawing? Like with the Rising Sun. Oh, that's true, actually, that yeah. Is, that is the thing, like, we can, mm -hmm. we can, like, go with the semi-bluff to play Bonds. Just play Bonds? I, I mean, it's a semi-bluff. Yeah. It can turn into a good play, or it's a terrible play, but yeah. they might still respect it. I think the chance of having uh, something on top here is not terrible. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is rough because like every other line that we can take just kind of sucks right now. Like we can go E strike five go again into bonds, you know, just going with like Nick. Yeah, I mean, and, uh... that's, that's 
that's the point we don't have a really good line yeah so I, think... I think bluffing the bonds and then hoping that we draw like a venomous bite or a hiss off the top is maybe not the worst idea and then we can bottom like the e-strike or something yeah so I'm i not... think actually going for bonds may maybe we can we can misplay it first pitching codex that uh, could be a problem sure yeah i'm not hating that let's go because they respect all misplayed. They did respect the misplayed so far quite a bit. And if they let it hit, it, the, the semi bluff is even better. Yeah. Maybe. True. True. Because it's also possible still... that they're in their stack. No. Okay. They block. So we're good. Yeah. They shouldn't be. I think. No. I, I think not. I think we have one more turn or something. They didn't pitch a lot in this game because we've been just pressuring them so much. So, okay, so let's see how they block. Okay, so they block for right. six. We I go. Th we still go with it for ten. We, we go with the plan, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah. And see what what it gives us. Yep. Okay. So we go to reactions. Sacred right. Arts? That's a good one. That's actually pretty good. That's yeah, good that's one. actually good. So we bottom the E strike. We play the Sacred Art. Pitching the Chi. Because, like, I mean, we're at 42. We can go shields down here. They only have two cards. There's no way they can kill us here. Um, if they have a D React, it's Perfect. kind of unfortunate right now, but. I think we banish. I mean, we, we have to banish an e pot here. Yep, e pot, I think, yeah, and 100%. Then maybe just. Uh, I don't think the I'm others sure really can... matter. Not really, just something that deals too. Yeah, so we just go with like Scalding Rain, I guess. Yeah, uh, I think the, yeah, Scalding Rain is probably the best. Um, I don't think there's any other one that makes sense here, so. No, I think two is the best we yep. can get. Just go with Scalding Rain. Yep. Okay, submit. No. Okay. No, I think we still want to pitch into Mask. Um. Sure, yeah, that makes sense. And Actually, do we want to pitch into Mask or do we pitch into New and set up the, the e pod? Maybe. Or the two damage, maybe. Yeah, so let's just do that. Yeah. Let's just play the other three reactions we have. Yeah. And get in for ten. Yeah, I think that's probably the correct play. I mean, if they yeah. have a D-react in hand, if we pitch to Mars, they can just play it out. They, they can just play it. It's... So I, I don't think it plays around anything. And if we pitch to New, we can get the E-pot, and that's actually pretty good. So. Yeah. So let's let's do that. Yep. And we go for both. Yeah, I, I think, think so. I don't know if we go for yeah, I mean we fuck up the pitch stack if it hits, so it's fine to do both, yeah. Exactly. Also we can reorder the triggers so that first we shuffle the deck and after that we Ah, the they card. have the sync in hand, unfortunately. That is unfortunate, yeah. And it cleans up the bonds exactly. Dang it. It's it's not the end of the world, yeah, I think. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, so we activate new here. Uh, Ether quickening, do we banish that? I think we leave that on top, actually. I think we do banish. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's just one more card at okay. this point. Right. Okay. And then probably e pot is the most mm -hmm. relevant card we could. Yeah. Play out. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah, e pot for sure. Like two damage, they're at ten. They don't they're not gonna care about two. Alright. Um the one other option we could have we could play Ether R because that gives us a ponder token. But I think e pot is better. And they can, uh, in theory, they could, in theory, use their tunic to prevent the 
Ether Arc, so I think Epod is the best. Right. Tunic is yeah. the argument. I think Epod it is. Yep. Okay. What a weird game. <laughs> That's definitely a very strange game, yeah. Hundred percent. Okay, there's the hiss. Unfortunately it, it, on it. Oh uh, no, we cannot transcend transcend, right? Um <laughs> I mean we can double transcend. Yeah, no, but we can't. Not, we need a. We need yet. an attack. Yeah, that's that's kind of unfortunate. Yeah, I mean we could theoretically crack the E part for a C and C, and then we can transcend. Um, but I don't know if that's actually good. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I don't think it is. Uh, I mean... So I guess what we can do is like we play out the C and C pitch to preserve tradition and then we just hit them with grains without transcending think, if they clean block it i think they should be in their pitch stack right yeah, now probably so probably the e strike uh, like the e pot cnc line isn't as terrible because they have to do something okay so you think we crack e pot for a cnc and then double transcend maybe mm. like if they really just don't block at all i wouldn't even transcend because they might kill us yeah true but if if they block the cnc we can maybe just try to go for it okay sure let's go for it interesting this is a weird game, man. I mean, it's not a line I've ever <laughs> okay, taken. Okay, yeah, they're, they're going for it. Um, they're cracking Storm Striders in response. Okay, let's just... Tome? Okay, yeah, that they're in there. The let's see what happens, yeah. I mean, we're at 42, and they don't run Kindle. It means a double wildfire, so... We can blank two on each wildfire, I think. Uh, yep, there's the wildfire. We are in AB3. Yeah, yeah. Uh, three on each wildfire. Yeah, sorry. My bad. Uh, that's another tome, sure. Let's see if they can kill us actually here, yeah. Pitching a lot of reds. Ragamuffins doing their stuff. Gaze the ages, goes back to hand. I oh, know they need to play it, right? Wait, is that triple wildfire? I think that's a triple wildfire, yeah. Okay, I think we're dead. <laughs> I mean... Don't know if they have the they resources have eight, to play all of that. They have eight resources, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, they might not actually. No, I don't think they have eight resources. No, they have five resources. Yes. Seven, actually. They have two e-pots, right? No, I think that's our e-pot. The last one seven. is ours, oh. yeah, but they had two. Okay, seven resources. That's yeah. two, four, six, seven. So they can just play out Yeah. all those. They can't really use Metacarpus, I think, because... They don't have the no, resources they, for they it. They don't have the resources. Yeah. This shouldn't be enough. I think this is fine. Ether Wildfire oh, for four. Yeah, we just pitch a, pitch a blue to it, right? Yeah. So we just pitch the preserve first. So this is coming for five now. Pitch another blue. Sure. So this ether and I think flare is coming for six. Prevent one, or okay, or no, we can prevent two, right? They do have another wildfire coming after this. So let's just prevent two. We and just prevent two here, yeah. And when the e pot finally resolves, we can dagger. <laughs> one with the dagger. 
Uh, no, no arcane barrier here. But yeah, they put us to 24 and then... I mean, the thing is like, I think they have a second kind of pitch stack here. Yeah, but, but it, it doesn't it kill us. Without... It doesn't have anything it's good in it except any... for like blazing. And they don't have striders. So yeah, I don't think they can kill us. Like, what's the maximum they can do with this? It's like Ether Spindle that they can pump up to like six. Yeah, so we take three. And then Blazing for like another, if they can use Metacarpus on it again. So Blazing would come in for seven. Should so be enough, it's I like think. 13 even if, and then maybe they have like, I don't know, Ether Darts, a couple of ones. So they can maybe do like 20. And that's kind of yeah, it. I mean they kind of messed up i feel like yeah i think like, they messed up their pitch stack the pitch a bit. stack was good but yeah they didn't have the resources for it i think that was the issue yeah they they pitched too many reds i think they should have let the the epot resolve and wait until we do some more stuff because we had a full hand if our hand was like only reds i think this play would have worked but against the deck that runs yeah, I mean, as many blues they, as we do eh. if they let our let our epod e resolve we play cnc yeah and it's basically the same scenario because then they have to decide if they want to go for it yeah, yeah. with the tome in arsenal true we would have taken like i think two or three more damage that way but no otherwise... just one yeah right? okay 14. they just concede all right Fair enough. Good game. Okay, nice. So yeah, you can win against Kano. And I, I, I don't I don't think this was like a terrible Kano. I would say this is like the average Kano, right? They knew how to pitch stack. They just kind of messed up their resource count. But they did manage to do like a triple wildfire pitch stack turn. I think the fact that we managed to grab one epot from them was very, very helpful. Because I think with a triple epot, this would have looked a lot different um yeah but... i mean definitely if you if you are able to to grab their epods that's yeah. first i like that's good for us yeah and um, we, we also the grabbed other... like the, the potion of deja vu i think that was one of the cards that we randomly banished uh with that yeah, exactly like, the, double with nick, the, with double trouble double trouble double nick turn yeah i think what we also try to do is pump up a bonds that they can't block yeah because that way we also kind of get like five more turns yep definitely yeah but that helps in this case like this was a weird game I yeah we just didn't see any transcend happen. in the early game that was just kind of strange and i mean to be fair like the gamble right that we had with the the rising sun paid off we found a double reaction in a way um, obviously, like a hiss or venomous bite would have been better, but I think it wasn't terrible because this way it allowed us to play out their own e pot against them. Um, so yeah, I, I think the the gamble that we could find uh, another reaction in the top did definitely work. So yeah, yeah overall, I, I just wanted to go for that play because the alternatives were terrible yeah like not that that great. hand that hand was just not good and the fact that they blocked the mist blade also told us that they weren't in their pitch stack yet right like so we, we knew we could go like pretty aggressive on this hand because they couldn't go off and we also have, were at like 42 life the entire game so that's a pretty good buffer um against most of their shenanigans so yeah sure yeah. and another interesting thing is even if we would have whiff, yeah, like they would have still committed one card to the misplate and two cards yeah. to the bonds, and yeah. it would have still been okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I mean by semi bluff. True. Yeah. That even if it turns out to not work, it yeah. still did work, kind of in a way. Yeah, that's true. However, that 
wasn't a really great showing for my list, I guess. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it, it showed that you can win against Kano, right? Which I think is seen as one of the, the worst matchups for Assassin traditionally. And you decided to go for AB3, which I think was extremely relevant in this specific match. Because uh, on AB2, I think we would have taken a lot more damage in total, right? Um, yeah, because I mean, they, they can could go for a combo in first cycle, maybe. I mean, the thing is, like on AB2, they could have also gone for Blazing. They did have a Blazing Ether in hand in that turn, they pitched it. Um, so they definitely could have set up a Blazing with the Raga Muffins. And then go for like a double wildfire blazing kind of turn. And I think on like AB2, that would have hurt a lot. So, yeah. I don't know. Like, it's weird. Kano is weird. And that was definitely a really strange game for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, it worked out. We won. So, definitely good. Not complaining about that. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, we went over the list. Uh, we explained like the. The sideboarding choices a little bit. We played a practiced game against the Kano, no less. So definitely not a matchup that you would normally think is assassin favored. Um, and with that, I think it's uh, it's time to close this out. Do you have any like any closing thoughts? Anything you want to share with the viewers? Uh, any shout outs to anybody? Um, anything like that? Well, if you try to. If you try to build this deck, or if you if you say like I want to play the list that Bino played in Nationals, um, of course you can go for it. But as uh, as we already discussed earlier, you always have to know what kind of decks you're expecting, what kind of meta you're expecting, and change like make changes to the list accordingly. Yeah. Um. Because I like the deck also works if it doesn't contain second tenant of three moons. Mm -hmm. If you feel like the card is too bad, or if you just find it ugly, play another one. It's totally fine. Yeah. And do tell me if you find a good blue card <laughs> for that spot. I, I think we're all kind of like scrounging on that one. Like I said, I ran cut down to size in blue. I also think it's not a good card. Um, I just happen to like the extra disruption a little bit more than the three block in that scenario. But I, I think that spot is just, at the moment, it's just bad, right? We just need like another good blue card, whether it's generic or ideally assassin even. Um, that can go in that slot, and right now we just don't have that. Um, that's just that's just how it is. But yeah, yeah. And then, well, not not regarding the deck anymore. Shout out to my team, obviously, to all the meeps. They are amazing, and they are also part of the reason why I was able to get so far. Yeah. Also, they sacrificed their t-shirts for drowning my tears after I almost had to be dropped of the of the draft table because of uh registering the wrong hero oh okay damn all that all that turned out to be solved okay nice for some reason good. and i came like i just had to play with an ip2 for the game okay but all right i mean that's not ideal but me. yeah yeah, but my team was very supportive in this in this tournament, and very nice. I don't know if I would have been able to win without them. Yeah, I think having like doesn't even have to be a team, but just going to an event with like somebody you know, like a friend or two, just to talk about stuff between rounds, you know, um, and just you know have somebody as like the kind of I don't know, just just kind of emotional support in a way, right? Um, I think it's a lot better to not go alone to an event like that and just have somebody that you know there that you can talk with and just, you know, share stories and stuff like that. Very important, yeah. definitely. Always take phones with you. Yep. Definitely true. All right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you know, thanks for, for being here, doing this with me. Um, it's been a long video. We're... we're over two hours again <laughs> kind of standard i think at this point for plague hive and yeah i had a good time 
definitely very glad to see uh, a new performing well, especially like German player performing well. And yeah, um, if anybody out there wants to give new a try, take this list. I think it's great. It definitely performed great. Um, like I said, the link will be down in the description of the video. If you have any questions about the deck, anything about the performance, the sideboarding, anything at all, just leave it down in the comments below and we'll try to do our best to answer it. Um, and with that, um, I think that's it. So see you guys in the next one.